Hey guys, welcome to Potential Church. I hope you had an incredible fourth if you're at one of our U.S. campuses. And now, if you're a guest, we're glad you're here. And you picked an incredible weekend to be here because one of our children's, uh, our middle son, Carson, is actually going to be speaking this weekend. It's his first, him and I have spoke together. He spoke on Wednesday, but this is his first time to speak on the weekend. And he's going to talk about something that he has learned firsthand. And so I think you're in for quite a treat. And when he comes out, give him a little grace and encouraging. Let him know that you appreciate that God works in the lives of multiple people going through multiple things. And that through God's word, he speaks incredible things. So when Carson comes out, Pastor Carson comes out, let him know you appreciate it. Yes, what is going on, Potential Church? How are you guys doing? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was tire entirely too premature. You don't know if I'm going to be any good yet, okay? I could be horrible, and you just clap for me. But it's all good. My, like he said, my name is Carson Grambling. I'm one of the pastors here at Potential Church. I get to hang out every weekend with your teenagers, your middle schoolers and high schoolers, and most of them are amazing. Some of you, not quite as much, but we love them all anyways. I love getting to hang out with them. And we are in our brand new series, Patio Vibes. So basically, throughout the summer, we're going to be in this series. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I remember having tons of great conversation out on the patio uh, with family, friends, all that. So we're going to create that environment here at Potential Church over the summer. So you might notice I've got some friends hanging out with me on stage, and they're going to be out here for the rest of the teaching, and they're going to be here uh, every weekend through this series, hanging out up here with me. So uh, what I want you guys to do to introduce yourselves, I want the man to say, uh, introduce each other, and I want the man to say uh, how long you guys have been together, and you cannot look at the wife for the answer, okay? Go ahead, start off all the way on the end. been together for 13 years, married for 10. Nice, married for 10 years. Here we go. Hi, my name is Mario. This is my beautiful wife, Kathy, and uh, we've been married for 15 years and together for almost 20. Wow, that is awesome. Hi, my name is Nick. This is my beautiful fiance, Carly, and we've been together for four and a half years. Nice, nice, nice. When's the wedding? April, April. So you're getting close, getting close. Here we go. Hi, my name is Ron. This is my wife, Jay. We've been together for 10 years. Only feels like a couple of years. That's how great it's been. And so, overall, 13. There we go. Here we go. Good afternoon. My name is Will Mantecon. And my beautiful wife, Ines Mantecon. Was that your first? Uh, the... Uh, According to the rules and regulations, uh, I, um, we were, we've been married for, <laughs> 58 years. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, 58 I, years. I, I didn't want to lie. You know, <laughs> I want to make sure that everything was perfect. 58 years. Follow that up. I can't follow that one up. Uh, Brian McCarty, I've been married to Erica for 13 incredible years. 13 years. That is awesome. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask the man a question that I believe you should know about your wife. Easy questions, gentlemen. Easy questions that every man knows about his lady. So I'm going to ask you that question. Your wife or fiance, uh, is going to nod yes if you're right. She's going to shake her head no if you are wrong, okay? So we're going to start all the way over here with Derek and Iris. What I want you to answer is, what is your wife's favorite band? What is her favorite band? Now I will tell you, Derek has yet to get a question right. He has been here for every service and has yet to get a question right. I'm believing in you. 
What is her favorite band? Well, <laughs> I lost all belief in you. When I said I do, we became a unit, so we <laughs> like Hillsong. <laughs> oh, he got it, finally. Yes. I saved your marriage. You're welcome. Mario, on to you guys. What is your wife's favorite food? Oh, that's pretty simple. Uh, she loves pasta. Any kind of pasta. Lasagna, Any kind of pasta. Is that? Fettuccine. Okay, two for two. We're doing better this time, gentlemen. We're doing better. Nick, don't screw it up. What is Carly's favorite holiday? What is her favorite holiday? That's easy. There's not that many. Christmas. Christmas. Okay. Three for three. These are easy questions. I want you guys to get some W's because I love you guys. Next one. If your wife was stranded on an island, what is the one food that she would want there with her? Italian food. Italian? I want specific. Italian doesn't do it. I want a dish. Manicotti. Is that right? <laughs> four for four, gentlemen. We're doing good. I'm keeping marriages together, and I feel very good about that. Here we go. Right here in the middle. This is where we lose it. <laughs> I want you to tell me. I'll be honest. I want you to tell me what your wife's favorite movie is. Favorite movie. We don't go to movies. You must have seen at least one movie in those one, 58 years. One movie. Years. Honey, one movie. <laughs> of course. Falls apart. TV. We watch a lot of TV. Okay. Movies in the TV. I'll take it. I'll take it. Fair enough. Last one. I've learned something from him. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Last one. I'm trying to think of a good one. I probably should have thought these more out. I'm going to go with what is your wife's favorite TV show? Favorite TV show. That's Doesn't easy. have to still be on. That's easy. Dexter. <laughs> Dexter, is he right? Is it Dexter? No, that is not, no, I'm not taking that. I'm not she, taking that, hey, I guess. She watches it every night, that is not true. Hey, you guys can handle that between each other. I'm just telling you, she did not say yes. But like I said, they're gonna be hanging out here with us. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Now, I think uh, my pop said that the last time, the only time I've been up here by myself was a Wednesday night. Right? It was incredible. I did awesome. So you guys need to come on Wednesday nights to hear me. But I'm just kidding. Anyways, I, uh, I was told that, like, don't, and you know what? Never mind. So Wednesday night, right? I'm up here. I'm teaching. And anytime you do something for the first time, you're just hoping you don't screw up. That's your only goal. Not to do good. Not to, no, no, no. You just don't want to screw up. Don't fall off the stage. Don't say anything stupid. That's my only goal. And then get out of there as quick as I possibly can before anyone has time to ask any questions. So that's what I'm trying to do. Don't fall off the stage, don't screw up. And I did it. So I felt accomplished, all good. Now, did anyone learn anything? Probably not, but I didn't fall off the stage and I didn't say anything stupid. And I'm walking to the lobby after, right? And I remember a guy comes up to me, runs up to me and grabs my arm. I'm like, oh gosh, what's going on right now? And he's like, hey, Listen, listen, listen. Man, great job. I loved the skit you did. The skit? I did no skit on stage. Which means either he fell asleep during the, during the message, has no idea what I did, he just knows I was up there. I mean, skit, like that, I would have, see the word I would have used is like teaching, preaching, divine message from God. Not skit, that was a weird word. However, I do have, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the skit I have prepared today. I think it's going to be good. I think we have a lot of fun. But that, you know, like I said, doing anything for the first time, it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. I also did something else for the first time, and hopefully only time. I uh, actually got engaged. I proposed to my girlfriend, Jessica. We are now engaged. Yes, and I was told to invite all of you guys December 31st. Come hang out with us. We're getting married here. It's going to be a great time. But I'm a little frustrated with you guys. 
if I'm being honest, I'm a little frustrated with everyone. Because I was con I told everyone who would listen that I was proposing to Jess. Everyone who would listen. And they would always ask the same question. You guys always ask the same question. How are you going to do it? What are you going to say? And every time I'd be like, that's a dumb question. I mean, it's a, I, I get down on one knee. Will you marry me? Yes. And that's it. Like, what do you mean? How am I going to do it? What am I going to say? And the reason I'm frustrated with you guys is because not one of you said, you're an idiot. Think through what you're going to do and what you're going to say. Not one of you said anything. Man, all you said was, man, I'm happy for you. Go do your thing. And so I had figured out, okay, we're going on vacation to Colorado with, uh, with my family. And she's coming along. I was like, this is the perfect place to propose. Perfect place. In the snow, on the mountains, this is going to be awesome. That's what was happening in my head. And so we get there. And I find this little, like, uh, uh, roundabout, right? And so I put the ring on the edge of the little roundabout that was hanging off a, of a mountain, right? I put it in the snow, and I'm like, this is going to be awesome, right? And so as I'm getting ready, every, my whole family's there. We've hidden this ring in the snow. I'm like, this is going to be great. Should have put it in the box in the snow. I didn't. I just put the ring in the snow on the edge of a mountain. And so my family's all hiding there. They're, they're like, and I remember Tyler asked me right before I left to go get Jess. I'm like, you guys got to hide. Tyler's like, hey, really quick, what are you going to say? Like, what do you, when she comes down, like, what are you, what are you going to say, you know, to propose? I'm like, I, dumb question. I don't know why you'd ask such a thing. I'm going to get down on one knee and say, hey, will you marry me? That's, I mean, what do you mean, what am I going to say? I do my best work just off the top of my head. Like, I haven't planned what I'm going to talk about today. I'm just flowing, right? I do my best work just on the spot kind of stuff. So, what, I, this is where I realized I have the worst brother ever. Because what a good brother would have said He's married. He's gone through this. What a good brother would have said is, you're an idiot. Plan out what you're going to say. That is not what he said. The same thing all of you did. Sounds great. I'm sure it'll be awesome. And he goes off to hide. Now, I go up to get Jess, and right as I got to the door, I realized that maybe I had made an error in judgment. That maybe putting the ring not in the box, just sitting there in the snow, on the edge of a mountain was not the best idea. And so what I had decided to do, this is what I decided in my head. Okay, if I get out there with Jess and there's no ring, if the ring for whatever reason has tumbled off the mountain, right, I'm just going to take it as a sign from God that me and Jess are just not meant to be. That is just not going to work out. It's just not going to happen. Because I can tell you right now, that ring costs more than I do. And I am not about to buy another one of those. And so I'm like, you know what, it's, it's just not meant to be. It's just not going to happen. Well, we get down there, and the ring is there. So I'm like, oh, thank goodness. She's, she sees it. She realizes what's about to happen. So she starts crying. Her makeup's all over the place. And as I go to get the ring, I really want you to see what this looked like. Because it was very embarrassing. So Carly is going to come over here. She's going to be Jess for this moment, okay? I really want you to get a feel for what happened. I go down. I get the ring, and I remembered, get down on one knee, so I did that, and this is where I realized I was in trouble, because I had no idea what was about to come out of my mouth, no idea at all. So I put the ring out, I was also wearing tight pants like I am now, so I was really uncomfortable, I was kind of like wobbling, <clears throat> I put the ring out, and in my head I'm like, Say something that is going to move her. Say something that is going to make everyone cry. So emotional. So powerful. So what I said was, you're really cool. I like you a lot. Let's do this thing. And that's, I, I tried, to, I'm like, you're an idiot. Say anything, anything else. Just something that is going to be moving and emotional and something they would put in like the notebook. Just anything. And nothing came out. I just stared at her for the rest of the time until she said yes. And it was a miserable experience. Thank you, Carly, for helping me out with that. It was awful. And I'm mad because none of you told me. No one said anything that you're supposed to prepare for these things. But, you know, I was thinking about it. And oftentimes, we talk a whole lot about dating. We give a, a lot of advice on how to do dating successfully. And we give a lot of advice on how to do marriage successfully. 
but it's rare we talk about that time in between when you are engaged. How do you know someone's the right one for you? How do you know that they're the one that you need to spend the rest of your life with? How do you, how do you know that? And so I wanted to kind of give you guys the same advice that was given to me. This is not stuff that I came up with. This is not stuff that I'm so smart. I am, but th that I didn't come up with this. This was given to me. And so I want to pass this on to you guys. Maybe it can help you. Now, if you're single right now, you're like, well, this doesn't apply to me. I, I really do believe that God is going to bring someone in your life. And you want to be ready for that. You want to know what you're looking for. You want to know when it's time to, to move things along. So I challenge you to stay engaged. And if you're married in here, and th you've already gone through this process, you know far more than I do. But, you know, I remember talking to a couple out in the lobby. And they had been married for quite some time. And they, they had gone through issues in the past. To the point where they weren't really sure things were going to work out. And I remember talking to them. I, rem I remember, I'll never forget what the man said. He said, we came to a point where we couldn't, we couldn't, neither one of us could remember why we got married. Neither one of us could remember what, what initially drawed us together. And so I think that if nothing else, this can help us remember what, what brought you two together in the first place. What are the core kind of things that hold that relationship together? So I want to jump straight into it. I don't want to waste much time. I don't think we'll be here long, but we could be. Who knows? We'll see. Like I said, I didn't write anything down, so I'm just flowing. Starting off with the first, the first one. You know when they are the one when they are more in love with God than they are with you. You know they are the one when they are more in love with God than they are with you. You know, I think this is often the one, if I'm honest, I think this is often the one that we kind of settle on. It sounds really good when we're at church listening to a message. It sounds great. Yes, amen, praise God. I'm done with these scrubs. I'm starting to date people who love God. And it sounds great, but it's the first one we're willing to let go of when someone comes along. Oftentimes we're a little too concerned about how much money they make, how good, they are, how good looking they are. But their relationship with God, that's, ah, we'll work on that. As long as they have these other things. And we settle on this. We don't take this quite as serious. You know, I think that in the Bible it talks about it very clearly. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? God is very clear about it right there. It's, it's not going to work. You can try. God gives us free will. That's one of the amazing things about God. He gives us free will. So you're welcome to try it. You're welcome to try and partner up and do life with someone who doesn't believe in me. But I promise you it's not going to work. That's a guarantee. It's not, hey, it might not work. Hey, do your best, but we'll see what happens. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. You can, you can try it, but it's not going to work. You're not going to have the relationship that you could have. But see, what so many of us do is we think, no, no, no I'm going to bring them. They're going to love God. They're going to follow God. I'm, I just got to get them there. It's a journey. To illustrate this, Nick is going to come help me really quick. This is something that my youth pastor used when I was a student. He used this to illustrate kind of that, that process of thinking we can bring someone up to us. Right? So we get in a relationship and we, they're unbelievers. And we think, man, I'm going to bring them up to where I'm at. I'm going to lift them up to where, to where I am. They're going to love God, they're going to serve, they're going to give, they're going to worship. But I've just, I've got to get them there, right? But oftentimes you can try as hard as you want and you're not going to be able to lift them to where you are. But it's so easy for them to start pulling you down. All these standards, all these beliefs that you have and you're fighting. You're like, no, 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 we're going this way. We're going this way. Remember, you're going to love God, you're going to worship God. And you pull, 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 but it's so much easier and eventually you get too tired and you fall. And you end up in the same place that they're in. You end up so much further than God. So much further away from God. Because you decided to get into relationship with someone who didn't have that same love for God. And please hear me. I'm not just talking about coming to service. Watching it. I'm talking about an active love for God. Being in love for God. So you've got to ask the person with, that you're with now. Are they in love with God? Truly in love. Meaning that their relationship with God right now should not look the way it did last year. Shouldn't be doing the same things that you were doing last year. 
shouldn't be three years of just coming to service and watching. It should be further along. I mean, if I told you, hey, this, this couple, they've been together for five years, but they act as if they just got together. Still don't really know anything about each other. Still not that committed. I would dare to say that you would imagine that that's not a healthy relationship. It's not a relationship where the people are in love. Is the person you're with, are they in love with God? Are they running after God? Now, I'm not saying that this means they need to be 100 miles down the road. They can be early on in that walk. But are they walking at all? Are they moving closer towards him or are they moving further away? Because I can promise you right now, there's no such thing as standing still. No one in this room is just standing still. I'm in the same place. You're either further ahead or you're further away. Where are they at? See, the sad thing is, is most of us think that, and, and I've, I'm guilty of this. Most of us think, it, well, we're in love. So it's all going to work out. You don't understand. I love them. That means it must all be okay. It must all work out in the end. But see, what the scripture teaches is you can fall in love with the wrong person. It's very easy. We're very capable of falling in love with someone that we have no business being, being with. So you've got to decide, is the person you're with, are they actively loving God? And if not, why waste your time? I can promise you, it, it, that's all it's going to be is a waste of time. A waste of time, a waste of heartache, a waste of pain. It doesn't have to be that way. Are they loving God? Are they in love with God? The second thing, you know they are the one when they meet your standards. This is actually something that, it's kind of a crazy story. Me and Jess have been a part of Potential Church for 18 years, 19 years. She's been here just about as long as I have. And what's wild is we never knew each other. We were part of the same kids ministry, same youth ministry, everything, but we had never met. But what was crazy is as we uh, became closer, we realized that we were at the same teaching in the youth ministry. Where our youth pastor, Pastor Scott, who's now pastoring a church in Minnesota, he had talked about standards and about writing down your standards. And he challenged everyone in the auditorium. He's like, I want you all, when you get home, write down what you're looking for in the person you're going to marry. Don't just build it up in your head. Don't just make up some things in your head. Write it down. Put it on paper. What are you looking for in the person you want to marry? And don't settle for anything less than that. No matter how dumb it may seem to everyone else, if they do not meet your standards, do not settle for it. He was so serious about this. And you know what's amazing is going back through, Jess still has that paper that she wrote when she was 15 about all the standards she has for the man that she wants to marry. And it was amazing to see how I st stood up to those standards, how I lived up to them. So I challenge everyone in here, man, what, this is not just for women. Men, write down, what are you looking for in the person you want to marry? And if someone comes along and they do not meet those standards, there's no, no business being with them. None at all. You're just going to waste a lot of time. And you're going to give your heart to someone who will never be able to handle it the way they should. You know, I think there's a lot of things in Scripture that God talks about. What our standards should be in, 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 in a relationship. But I, there's just really one that I want to talk. I, I challenge you, do your own research, pray on it, and really pray about what your standards should be. But there's just one that I want to talk about today. One that I don't think gets talked about a lot. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And just so you have context, this story is involving two people. King David, king of Israel, and Michael. A lady named Michael, who was Saul's daughter. Now, David at this time was in a tent and he was worshiping God harder than you have ever seen anyone worship. Giving everything he had in worship. Absolutely everything. He was giving it to God in this moment. So much so, he was worshiping so hard that scripture literally says his clothes fell off. And as Michael was watching David worship like this, she responded the same way a lot of people respond nowadays. That's not the way a man should look. Men shouldn't worship like that. Men shouldn't be exposed like that. Men shouldn't be emotional like that. That's not, that's not the way a man should look. Men shouldn't worship like that. And David says this in response to him. 
He says, in God's presence, I'll dance all I want. He chose me over your father and the rest of your family and made me prince over God's people over Israel. Oh, yes, I'll dance to God's glory more recklessly even than this. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll gladly look like a fool. But among these maids you're so worried about, I'll be honored no end. See, David understood something that I think we need to understand. Find someone who will worship. I mean really worship. I don't mean just come to service and nod their head as the, as the band's playing. Or someone who might mouth a few of the words. Someone who really gives everything they have in worship. And I'm not just talking about the, the singing. Everyone responds to that differently. I'm not just talking about singing. I'm talking about giving, about serving, praying before, before you eat. Whatever it may be, big or small, do they worship God in all of it? Truly worship, meaning they give God everything they have in that moment. They don't hold anything back from him. They show him as much respect and adoration as possible. Because I can promise you, if they are afraid to show emotion towards God in public, they will be afraid to show emotion towards you. I promise. Find someone who will worship in front of everyone. Just like David, not caring how they look, not caring what the world says about them. That men shouldn't look that way, men shouldn't worship that way, men shouldn't show emotion like that. Find someone who will worship with everything they have. And I, I truly believe that that will get you so much further ahead than worrying about how much money they make or how good looking they are. Find someone who will worship. So you know they are the one when they are more in love with God than they are with you. When they meet your standards. And lastly, you know they are the one when you can trust them. And this sounds really simple, really easy. And we throw, a word, or we throw around that word trust all the time. But I don't, I don't think we always fully understand it. I know I didn't. If you had asked me a few years ago, do you trust Jess? I, of course I do. Of course I do. I trust her, she trusts me. But you know, I think trust means a little more than what we can sometimes use it as. Do you really trust them with everything you have, with everything you are? Meaning, that do they have the power to completely ruin your life if you're wrong about them? Meaning that if you're wrong about them, if they're not who you thought they were, do they have the power to completely wreck your life in every aspect of it? Have you given them that power? Do you trust them that much? See, I think God asked for that same kind of faith in him, that same trust in him. I can tell you right now, if God is not who he said he was, my life is over. Every dream, every desire, everything I have done is through him. If he is not who he says he is, my life's done. But see, what I think we get really good at is we're really good at coming up with a plan B. An ulterior, you know, an ulterior plan. Man, I love them, I trust them, but if things don't work out, because you know, people are people, people can change. If things don't work out, here's what I'll do instead. Here's my backup plan. And see, what I think real trust is, is there's no backup plan. There's no plan B. It means you give them every part of you. And if they go down, you're going down with them. It means there's no, there's no well, if they, you know, if they start going down, I'm going to step over here and do this thing. It means no, no matter what. No matter what, I'm giving them every part of me. Meaning that they, man, if, if they're not who I thought they were, my life's done. My life's over. Do you trust them that much to give them every part of you? You know, I think it's clear from Scripture that God takes this stuff so serious. So serious. It means so much to Him. And I think the reason is, is because there are too many people out there who are part of a marriage and they feel like, man, this isn't what I signed up for. I didn't, I, this is not the person I thought I was marrying. They're totally different than when we first got together. I didn't, I didn't know this is what I was in for. You know, I... A few times before I went to Colorado, when I proposed to Jess, we had gone uh, before that. We were on vacation during Christmas, we went to Colorado, and we went skiing. Now, if, like I said before, the first time you do anything, it's awful. It's not fun. So when we went skiing, this was not a fun experience. This was not an enjoyable experience. We're, we're going down uh, this, like, bunny hill over and over and over. You feel like a loser going down the bunny hill. Just again and again and again. And we got to midday. And basically everyone had quit by that point. 
my dad was, it's weird. I've, my dad's pretty athletic. I've never seen him, like, not be able to do a sport. He could not ski to save his life. He was awful. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't figure it out. He ran over the instructor multiple times. He's a big guy. I felt so bad. My mom was equally as bad, if not worse. She couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. She was falling like on the little carpet that takes you up to the bunny hill, knocking kids out left and right. It was awful. Bailey never even put her skis on. She hated it from the moment we got there. This is too cold. I don't know why anyone would want to do this. This is dumb. And me and Tyler weren't enjoying ourselves, but we were the better ones out of everyone else, which obviously, as I said, is not saying much. And I remember, like, not really wanting to do it, but my dad told me and Tyler, we paid for skiing. You guys are doing it. You're finishing. He's like, all right, that's kind of a double standard, but whatever. We'll finish it. So me and Tyler are going down the bunny hill a few more times. I'm like, dude, I'm done with this. We're doing the mountain. We're doing the mountain. We're going down. It's not going to look clean. It's not going to look pretty, but at least we can say we did it. So me, Tyler, and the instructor go to the top of this mountain. And this is, I mean, this is unsafe. They said it was a green. This was no green, okay? This was like black diamond. Just, I, I knew, looking at it, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm just not. So we get to the top, and I go down this section, and I did okay. I had done board sports before. I grew up doing board sports, surfing, skateboarding, all that kind of stuff. So I did okay. I'm at the bottom, and I'm looking up at Tyler. And you know when you see on someone's face that they're just – they shouldn't be doing what they're about to do. That's the look I see on Tyler's face. Like, he is not ready, nor is he prepared for what he's about to do. He's also not confident in what he's about to do. And I see that look on his face. And he, the instructor kind of edges him out off the edge of the mountain. And if the instructor has to push you, you're not ready. The instructor pushes him, and he starts going down the mountain. Looking good at first, but then he starts hitting speeds that are a little too fast. He starts going way too fast. And you know that if, if you've ever done a board sport before, you probably understand there's a speed you get to where it's a lose-lose no matter what. Because it's going to hurt really bad to stop because you're going way too fast and you can't stop. But at the same time, the only other option is just to bomb it and just pray to God that you don't hit anyone. Tyler decided to pray to God that he didn't hit anyone. And he just bombs this mountain. I mean, he's going so fast, way too fast. And I'm at the bottom of the mountain. Keep in mind, no one is on this mountain. It's massive. There's tons of room. He could go anywhere. And I'm looking up at him from the bottom like, man, he's going way too fast, too fast. I really don't know why he's slowing down. He should slow down. He's going way too fast. He's headed straight for me, straight for me. This man runs straight into me, straight into me. And it was literally like, like a movie. I'm holding on to him. He's holding on to me. I'm going backwards down this mountain. Backwards. Way too fast. Way too fast. I mean, we're bombing this mountain. And, and I remember him, he's like, or I yelled to him, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I don't want to be here. I don't know why we're doing this. I'm like, stop complaining. Fix this. You caused us to be in this situation. You fix it. And he says, I have an idea. I'm like, what are we going to do? And then on command, he throws me off of him. And I just ragdoll off to the side, rolling, skis flying in the air. And as I hit the ground, I look up at him, and he is still going way too, he's picked up more speed. He's going fast to the point where other people are on the mountain looking at him like, oh, snap, what is going on here? But he didn't look like, oh, man, he must be really good. He knows what he's doing, clearly. He looked like, Someone needs to help him. He's going to die. And I looked a little ahead of him. And there was a cliff edge. Like just the edge of, here's the crazy thing if you've never been about skiing and snowboarding. It's really easy to just fly off the edge of the mountain. Really easy. There's not a lot of ropes and stuff guarding it. So he's coming to the edge of this mountain and going way too fast. And he's already committed to not stop it. I mean, if, if he was going to stop, I feel like he would have stopped before he rammed straight into me. So he's going so fast to the point where I'm just having to accept the fact this is the last time I'm going to see my brother. He, this is how he ends. This is how he dies right here on this mountain. 
I'm already thinking through who's going to get his room. I feel like I should get it. I'm the next oldest. And I'm going through all this in my head. He comes to the, uh, guys, I swear you not. He's literally, if that's the edge of the mountain, he's here. And, I mean, I've just accepted it at this point. And at the last second, he just, like a dead fish, just flops his body into the ground. And he sli he's still sliding to the point where one ski was hanging off the edge of this mountain. It was crazy. Somehow he survived it. And I remember being so angry afterwards. Like, that was hilarious. But I shouldn't have been a part of it. I had no business being a part of it. You dragged me into it. And it's really funny when that happens at the top of the mountain as we're skiing. It's not really funny when we feel that way in our relationship. We feel like I had no business being a part of this. I didn't ask for this. And all of a sudden, I got dragged into this relationship that I, I'm not sure why we ever started to begin with. This isn't what I asked for. This isn't the person that I initially got with. I don't have any business being a part of this. What happened? It was amazing. We loved each other. We were running after God, but now I can't drag them to service. They don't worship anymore. Too afraid of what other people think. They don't serve. They don't give. All these things that I thought our relationship was going to look like. But here's the greatest thing about God. This is what, I mean, it's so amazing. Even though we might screw up. Even though we might make a decision a little too hastily. Even though we might make a poor decision. He doesn't leave us there. He, he rescues us from that situation even if we caused it. No matter what. You guys can go ahead and bow your heads. There's a verse that's been kind of stuck in my head for the past few months. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it says, love takes everything, everything, every mistake, every sacrifice, every screw up, every heartbreak. Love takes everything that comes without giving up. Love believes all things. Love hopes for all things. Love keeps on in all things. You know, like I said, the greatest thing about Jesus is that he doesn't leave us where we are. I'm going to be honest with you. If you're in that boat and you're in that relationship and you're like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what the healing process looks through all of that. But I can tell you what scripture says it isn't. It's not running away. It's not quitting. God says very clearly, love keeps on in everything. And this was a really hard thing to deal with. Am I willing to keep on with Jess no matter what happens, no matter how bad I might screw up or she might screw up? Am I going to stick with it no matter what? Because I trust her. Because every part of me she has. Everything. The mistakes, the screw ups. She's got it all. The parts of me I like, the parts of me I don't like. Am I willing to keep on no matter what? Because see, the greatest thing is, I think when we can really do this, when we can really understand this and apply this to our lives, I think we can experience a relationship that is so much more than we could have ever imagined. So don't be discouraged. If you're like, man, I, I, I wish I would have heard this earlier. Don't be discouraged. Because God really can bring healing to that relationship. And maybe you're in here and you're like, man, this all sounds great, but I, I've been waiting on someone for a long time. I prayed that prayer for someone over and over and over again, and they still haven't come. I'm not really sure God's listening. I'm not really sure God's there because I am still waiting for someone. And when we get desperate, we start to settle. We start dating people that we have no business dating. What are those standards? And are you going to hold on to those no matter what? Do you trust God no matter what? Dear Lord, we come to you now. Lord, I pray that we take this so serious because we know you do. Lord, I pray that if, if we're in here and we're single, Lord, and we, we've been waiting for what feels like forever. We've been waiting, we've been praying for that person to come along. Maybe we've even denied a few people that we knew were no good for us, but we're still waiting. Lord, I pray that we don't, we don't settle. 
We don't get dismayed, Lord, that we, we trust you. And we trust that when that person comes, the wait will be 100% worth it. And if we're in here, Lord, and maybe we feel like we're a part of a relationship that it's not going where we want it. It's not in the place we want it to be in. It's not this love that you talk about in 1 Corinthians. Lord, I pray that you heal that, that relationship, that you bring healing, you bring joy, you bring peace, Lord. And that no matter what, you give us the will to keep on. No matter what mistakes, no matter what screw-ups, no matter what heartache has come from that relationship, that we keep on knowing that we will experience healing. Lord, I pray that we trust you give you every part of us because you've done the same thing for us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.